Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Richard Cobden, and welcome to the Sussex Wildlife Trust Helping Hedgehogs webinar. Um, tonight's webinar has been organised by the um, Eastbourne local group, so we're very grateful to them and to Charlotte Owen, who is going to be doing the presentation for us. Um, you'll notice down at the bottom of your screen, uh, there is a question and answer feature. If you have any questions, um, type them into that box. And then uh, if there's time at the end, we will uh, discuss those with Charlotte and hopefully get some answers for you. Uh, thank you for coming along tonight. Um, I'm now gonna hand you over to Janet Knott from the Sussex Wildlife Trust Eastbourne Group. Thank you. Good evening. Um, welcome to our first talk of the autumn season. Uh, and thanks again to the Sussex Wildlife Trust for enabling us to have our talks online. Um, I'm Janet Knott, the secretary of the Sussex Wildlife Trust's Eastbourne Local Group. And I'm glad that you can join us this evening and hope that you'll join us again for our October talk by the SWT's Dr Barry Yates, who will be recounting his adventures with his trail cam at Rye Harbour Nature Reserve. Now for tonight's talk, unbelievably one of Britain's favourite animals is officially vulnerable to extinction, but we can all help hedgehogs and the Sussex Wildlife Trust's Charlotte Owen is here to tell us how. So thank you and over to Charlotte. Hello everyone, hopefully you can uh, see me okay. Um, this is probably one of our most popular topics um, when it comes to hedgehogs. I can't think of a single person who doesn't like hedgehogs. Um, and when it comes to inquiries that come through um, for Wild Call, uh, which is my job at the Trust, hedgehogs are guaranteed to be in the top 10 um, questions. People are always interested in one aspect or another um, of what hedgehogs are up to. Um, they are clearly uh, Britain's favourite wild animal. They've, they've been officially voted um, the favourite, um, and people are interested in all aspects of whether it's feeding them, um, finding them, um, providing them with medical care if they find them when they're injured. Um, but the perennial question we always get is where can I get a hedgehog for my garden? People really want hedgehogs and they want to get hold of one. Um, while that's clearly not possible for a wild animal, um, what you can do um, is buy pretty much everything you could imagine that a hedgehog would need to encourage them into your garden. So I did a quick Google search on shopping uh, for hedgehogs. Um, so you can get anything for um, houses that come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, and I have to say this, this rather lovely stone one is, is probably the nicest I've ever seen with its little mossy green roof. Um, luxurious accommodation, yep, you can buy that. You can buy feeding stations uh, to make sure that any food that you put out for them, and there's a huge range of hedgehog food on the market, um, that you can buy especially for them to put in there. And even special hedgehog gates to make sure they can actually get into your garden. So all kinds of products designed for encouraging hedgehogs into your garden. But it doesn't stop there when it comes to shopping for hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are on all kinds of things. They're on jugs, they're on trays. You can get hedgehog mugs, hedgehog lamps, hedgehog mittens, hedgehog socks, uh, and for some bizarre reason, tiny socks for hedgehogs as well. So clearly we are smitten um, with these little creatures. So why is that? What's going on? Well, clearly they are pretty cute. Um, you can't argue with that. They're also our only spiny mammal. Nothing else comes close to a hedgehog. And one question we never get asked is I've seen this really weird creature in my garden with spines. Can you tell me what it is? Everyone recognizes a hedgehog without doubt. And the nice thing about that is that they're pretty, um, you know, common. We're used to seeing them. They come to us, they come to our gardens. Um, they once were uh, everyday wildlife. And when they do turn up, they provide a useful service for us as well. Um, so they do eat slugs and snails and other creepy crawlies in the garden, um, providing a useful pest control service. They're pretty friendly, especially if you put food out for them. They know who your friends are. They know when you put the food out and they turn up just on time to eat it. And um, they don't tend to be too terrified of us. You can get quite close to them. You can see them. Um, you can interact with them um, quite easily. They're very accessible, but they're also feisty. So if you've ever seen hedgehogs 
um, kind of having a go at each other. It looks quite comical, but they mean business. They can be quite aggressive um, and they're quite entertaining to watch and quite beloved as well. So there's all sorts of examples going back hundreds of years in literature, with the most famous, of course, probably being Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Um, and apparently the character was based on a pet hedgehog that Beatrix Potter owned herself. Um, other fictional hedgehogs didn't fare quite so well. Um, so if we think about Alice's adventures in Wonderland, where the poor old hedgehogs um, were actually used as crow cables. Um, but generally, we do love hedgehogs. Um, folklore as well, there's loads of interesting stories about hedgehogs going back um, hundreds of years again. So people used to think that they could steal milk from cows. Um, and in medieval times, for some bizarre reason, they thought that hedgehogs had spines so that they could spear apples and other fruits on them and carry them around and transport them. Um, that's not true. And uh, I'm not entirely sure how they'd get the fruit off again, even if they could do that. Um, but there's, there's clearly been a, a long held fascination um, with these spiky little creatures. And sadly, these days, they are in decline. Um, and we Brits do tend to love an underlook. So that's probably got something to do with it as well. Um, and perhaps most importantly, hedgehogs make really good birthday cakes. So hedgehogs have been around um, for quite a long time um, and they haven't changed much during that period. So they first um, kind of emerged about 15 million years ago. So the earth um, looked a bit different. We don't quite have some of these large creatures wandering around. Um, but we did have uh, hedgehogs, and they didn't really look much different than they do today, although clearly um, they wouldn't have been around in the daytime because they have always been nocturnal. So they've been around a long time, um, relatively unchanged. But if we go back in time even further, so we've gone back 52 million years ago, and we've hopped over to Canada now, um, this is actually quite a recently discovered ancient hedgehog, the little creature at the front there, tiny forest dweller is what the name translates to. Um, and they only discovered this, um, it's new to science, in 2014. Um, and it used to live in what was once rainforest um, in, in Canada there. And it was incredibly tiny. Um, it was really about the size of a harvest mouse, um, and much more shrew-like. Um, and indeed, hedgehogs are distantly, distantly related to shrews. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that this ancient hedgehog was found in Canada. Um, and there are no hedgehogs in Canada today. In fact, none in North America or South America whatsoever. So we only have them um, in Europe, here in Europe, in Africa and in Asia is where they're currently restricted to. Um, but yeah, definite linkage in with, with shrews. You can certainly see the resemblance um, there. So today's hedgehogs, there's 17 different species um, across Europe, Asia, Africa. Um, and you can see from these examples, there's, not, there's still not a great deal of variation. Um, you can tell that all of these are hedgehogs. Probably the most obvious feature that does, does alter a little bit is the ears. And you can see um, some of those um, hedgehogs have quite impressive big ears. And they tend to be the ones that live in desert regions where it's pretty hot and their big ears help them with temperature regulation. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much all hedgehogs look alike. They've got a lot of common features. Here's ours, uh, the Western European hedgehog, um, which will be familiar to many of you. Um, hopefully, some of you have seen a real hedgehog. Sadly, um, a lot of kids today especially will have never actually seen one um, in real life, um, but hopefully they're still familiar at least with, with what a hedgehog looks like. Um, but yes, they do have um, a few typical hedgehog features, and this is another nice example um, of how much we love hedgehogs. This is a greetings card. Um, with the bizarre subject of the anatomy of a hedgehog. Um, and clearly the most important features there that, that tend to define a hedgehog as a hedgehog is the stiffy stabbies there and the fact that it's got a curlable posterior. So it's spiky and it can curl up into a ball, um, which, yep, there we go. There's, there's some facts. It's, it's not too far off. But in real life, obviously, this is what a hedgehog looks like. And it is covered in spines, um, an incredible number of spines, really, on an individual hedgehog. Um, it's somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 spines. Um, I guess someone at some point must have uh, counted them somehow. Um, but uh, they are um, modified hairs. Um, so hedgehogs do have fur as well. You can see the fur um, around the head there. But the spines are modified hairs. They've been stiffened with a protein called keratin, which is the same stuff that's in our fingernails and in our hair. Um, and that's what makes, um, turns the hairs into these, these um, wonderful spikes. 
um, but they are firmly attached, so they can't they can't jettison them like porcupines or, or do anything like that with them. Um, but they do form a really effective defence for them when they do curl up into a ball, um, and they have a kind of ring of muscle that goes around their bodies. And when they contract this, it's it's like pulling the cord on a drawstring bag, and that's how they kind of curl up really tightly, and and you just cannot prise them open again. Um, unless you happen to be a badger, which is pretty much the only natural predator um, that can penetrate their defences. Um, but yes, they are only spiny creature, um, and that's uh, that's the really defining feature. Most hedgehogs, uh, they can live for two to five years, um, potentially longer if they're lucky. Um, they don't actually reach maturity to be able to breed until they are two years old. Um, so um, that that's a factor in sort of... Um, perhaps in limiting, limiting their numbers if there are high mortality rates when, when they're youngsters. Um, but generally two to five years and their weight um, can be sort of up to two kilograms, perhaps beyond, and that does vary quite a bit over the course of a year, um, as we'll find out. So other typical features of a hedgehog, um, they do have pretty small ears, but they are very sensitive ears. Again, they're sort of hidden away there in the fur, um, but that's a key sense for them because they don't have brilliant eyesight, um, they are nocturnal, they don't rely heavily on seeing what's going on, though they're far from blind. But perhaps their um, kind of primary sense is, is smell. They've got incredibly sensitive noses and they can detect um, food under the soil sort of a good couple of inches down and then use their powerful front paws to dig down um, and access that food. Um, and they do have um, quite, in, uh, quite, long, quite long legs. You can't tell in this photo in particular, but their legs are generally um, hidden underneath the spines. They've sort of got a bit of a skirt that hangs down um, and hides the extent of their legs there. Um, but having a look at the skeleton, you can get a better idea of just um, how long those legs are. Um, they're about 10 centimetres um, in length. That gives you an idea of, of the size of them. And you only really see them in a living hedgehog when it decides to run. Um, so you can see here this hedgehog's lifted itself right up and you can see the little legs going. And they can um, pick up quite a bit of speed. Um, they're not the speediest creatures in the world, um, but they can certainly move when they need to. So if they are startled or need to move into cover quickly, um, they can trundle along at quite an impressive speed. So where the hedgehogs like to live, where can we expect to see them? Um, they are typical really of, of the traditional British countryside. So um, a landscape which is a mosaic of open fields, grassland, um, lots of hedgerows crisscrossing that, patches of woodland. Um, and hedgerows really are the key. Um, so they're called hedgehogs because hedgerows are a really key habitat for them. Um, they're a habitat in and of themselves. They provide shelter, nesting opportunities, um, protection from predators. Um, as well as food, there's lots of creepy crawlies in there for them to eat. Um, but also, really importantly, they provide corridors um, that connect up the landscape and allow them to move safely through it um, in between their foraging areas and nesting sites and all the rest of it. Um, so our traditional kind of rural landscape has changed quite a bit, but that's ideally what they like. You can find them in woodland. They're usually sort of on the woodland edge rather than the deep woodland species. Um, but also in sort of grassy places like churchyards, playing fields, but particularly gardens. Um, and in urban areas, especially, gardens have become quite a stronghold for our hedgehogs. And if you're lucky, you'll see the hedgehogs um, as they visit your garden, if they do visit. But they can be surprisingly elusive. So it's not always obvious um, that they've been around and you might not actually see the hedgehogs themselves. But there are a few signs um, that you can look out for that provide clues that hedgehogs have been uh, visiting. So the most uh, useful calling card, if you like, and the one people do tend to get excited about, probably the only kind of poo that people welcome finding in their garden is a bit of hedgehog poo. Um, it is quite distinctive. It's quite dark in colour usually, although it can vary depending on what they've been eating. It's usually um, a few centimetres long. Um, that sort of two, two pence piece gives you an idea of scale there. Um, and you can see in the larger picture there, uh, those kind of little lumps in the poo. And that's quite typical of how to identify a hedgehog poo, because normally they do eat a lot of beetles, um, but the hard sort of outer exoskeleton of the beetles is completely indigestible. So the poo tends to be full of these little bits of beetle 
Um, and sometimes they even shimmer still if, if the light catches. So sparkly poo is a good sign that you've got hedgehog poo. Um, but that's a good, uh, a good sign that hedgehogs have, have, have at least been passing through the garden um, and paid you a visit. And other things to look out for are footprints. And they do have quite distinctive footprints. Um, their front paws are quite different from their back paws. So sometimes it looks like you've got two separate sets um, of footprints going on. And it's their front paws that are the wider ones. They look more like little hands and the back paws are, are much narrower. Um, so if it's been a bit muddy, you might find um, these in the garden. Both of them have five toes. And if you get your eye in and the nice clear print, which is not always uh, possible depending on uh, how soft the mud might be, um, but that's what to look out for. Um, but what you can do as well is to try and create a footprint tunnel. Um, this is quite a good way, really, the only reliable way of telling whether you've got hedgehogs on a site um, definitively. The idea being that you create some sort of tunnel so they pass through from one end to the other. And you can just see in the middle there, um, that's like an ink pad. So it's, it's usually a mixture of um, charcoal and oil. So it's completely safe and non-toxic. Um, and the hedgehog trundles in, gets some ink on its feet um, and leaves some footprints behind. So you end up um, with something like this. This has been filmed with a little trail camera. Um, and you can see they're quite distinctive little handprint um, left behind. Um, so that's a really good way of sort of surveying for hedgehogs. Um, but it really does, you know, you can't really beat um, a good trail camera. And it's fantastic that these are really quite accessible these days and quite a few people um, have been able to put one out in their gardens to see what's going on after dark, which is really valuable for a nocturnal creature um, like the hedgehog. Um, and this is just quite a nice um, compilation of clips that people have filmed in their gardens of hedgehogs going about their business um, as part of the Hedgehog Street um, campaign. So I just thought this is quite a nice little introduction to uh, hedgehog behaviour. So let's have a go. So I think that also highlights why we like hedgehogs so much, really. I mean, they get themselves into all kinds of weird predicaments. I mean, balancing on a miniature picnic table. There's no need for a hedgehog to be doing that. And yet there's a hedgehog doing that. So um, fascinating to watch, but also providing some really useful information um, on hedgehog behaviour and where they are and what they're doing and how well they're doing. Um, so, yeah, if you've got a trail camera um, or if you, if you haven't, I definitely recommend getting one. But it's always worth putting that out to see what's going on in the garden. So as to what's going on at the moment um, in the life of hedgehogs, you can see from this chart, there's sort of three main elements really um, to a hedgehog's life. Sleeping, uh, eating and making more hedgehogs, which you know you could say that of most species really, that's, that's the key to their lives, surviving and making more. Um, but at the moment, um, we're sort of heading into October Hedgehogs are starting to prepare for winter, so it doesn't feel particularly 
um, autumnal or wintry just yet, but um, the weather may well change soon. So hedgehogs are looking for um, a nest site. They're going to be busy finding a nice safe location to build a nest, um, getting that all prepared, um, ready to hibernate over winter time. So the kind of sites that they like to find um, is they're looking for somewhere that's safe and sheltered from the elements and from predators. Um, so natural hedge sites um, provide excellent hibernation opportunities. Um, a nice thick native hedge that's quite wild and tangled, lots of brambles um, and other dense vegetation provide good um, nesting opportunities for hedgehogs and lots of dead leaves for bedding. And sometimes if you've sort of got a big pile of leaves in a, in a corner left undisturbed, they might just tunnel in there um, and, and hibernate in amongst the leaf pile. Um, but also they like to get underneath sheds, provide a perfect spot for hedgehogs. And of course, they take up residence in our um, handily provided hedgehog homes um, of all shapes and sizes. Most hedgehogs before, um, while they're sort of thinking about winter and, and creating the nests, it's also absolutely crucial for them to be fattening up. So during hibernation, they have to rely on their fat reserves to see them through potentially three or four months of the year um, if we get a harsh winter. And that's, that's a long time. So they really need to fatten up and bearing in mind the poor old females um, have been busy um, rearing uh, young hedgehogs um, all summer and spring. Um, they in particular definitely need to feed up and, and put on some weight. Um, so supplementary feeding at this time of year is particularly important to help them bulk up um, and get ready for winter. But their natural food is quite varied. Um, essentially, they're eating invertebrates, so creepy crawlies, insects, beetles. Um, but the main components, um, as well as beetles, are caterpillars and, and earthworms. Um, but also things like um, slugs and snails to an extent. They tend to be a bit fussy about which kind of slugs they'll eat. Um, we saw in that video just now um, a hedgehog grappling with, with quite a large slug um, and they have to sort of de-slime them before they can eat them. And they tend to prefer the smaller slugs, um, but uh, things like earwigs and millipedes. Essentially, they're opportunistic, um, so they'll eat whatever they can find. And it does vary um, throughout the year. So this gives you an idea. I mean, earthworms constantly important to them. Um, you'll see this only um, runs from April to October, assuming that they'll be asleep um, over the winter months. Um, but yes, as caterpillars become available towards late summer and in the spring, they'll munch on those. Uh, but anything else they come across, um, birds, eggs, um, nests of other small mammals, um, frogs, carrion, fallen fruit, they'll enjoy um, whatever they can get hold of. And it's all going um, to help them fatten up at this time of year. So in their quest for food and for nesting sites, hedgehogs will actually travel quite a significant distance. Um, so this gives you an idea um, of a typical kind of neighbourhood with a playing field, and that's where the nest site is for this particular hedgehog. And it's got a little route that it'll do, um, skirting through the gardens, avoiding some, the bear garden, there's nothing much in there for it, it's just a patio. And there's a car park there where it will just avoid that because there's nothing, uh, nothing to benefit it there. Um, but some of these gardens, one's got a vegetable patch, one's really got um, plenty of hedges and shrubs and wild areas. One of them's uh, got a food bowl and a pond where it can access some water and it meanders through the allotments doing a bit of pest control on its nightly journeys. And we know from radio tracking um, that hedgehogs can travel um, sort of two kilometres in a single night and males, they will travel further during the breeding season in their search for a mate. So um, perhaps even up to three kilometres. And um, a typical hedgehog home range is pretty large, um, probably much larger than is shown um, on that little kind of map there as well. Um, it does depend on the habitat quality, um, what food's available and what else is going on there. But typically it's 10 to 20 hectares, which is 25 to 50 acres. Um, that may not mean much to you, but one acre is 16 tennis courts. Um, so that's quite a significant size, and we're talking sort of 25 to 50 of those. Um, so it's up to 800 tennis courts. So essentially quite a few gardens. Um, I probably struggled to fit one tennis court in my garden, I think. Um, so that hedgehog that you're seeing in your garden is almost certainly the same hedgehog that your neighbour sees in their garden, uh, and probably the house right at the end of the street and perhaps beyond. So they really are roaming at quite a landscape scale throughout the neighbourhood, trying to find everything that they need. Um, so when do hedgehogs hibernate? That's a popular question. And it's um, quite a movable um, 
time really because it all does depend on what the weather decides to do so if it stays mild um, and there's still food to be found hedgehogs will still be active um, it doesn't matter you can keep feeding them a lot of people are worried that if they keep feeding them um, they'll never go into hibernation because they'll keep eating but eventually when it gets cold enough um, it will still trigger them to go to sleep so it's fine to keep feeding them until they do and hedgehogs are one of the few native mammals that do truly hibernate um, that's alongside bats and dormice um, and essentially what happens it's it is a bit like a very deep sleep but it goes a step further so their body temperature drops right down to match the ambient temperature um, their heart rate drops to be as slow as possible and their breathing slows right down as well so everything gets as slow as possible and just kind of keeps going at a maintenance level to keep the hedgehog alive whilst using um, as little energy as possible, um, because obviously they are surviving on their body fat. And once that's gone, it's gone. So they need to um, make the most of it and make it last as long as they can. So when they are hibernating, um, they, they, they're pretty unresponsive. They might look, um, you know, as, as if they're um, very deeply asleep and would feel cold to the touch. But it's really important not to disturb them, because if they do wake up, um, obviously, that's wasting energy for them, and then they have to drop back down into hibernation again. Um, it isn't unusual to see them once they do hibernate. They do sometimes wake up and move between nest sites. Most hedgehogs do have a couple of nest sites and will move at least once during their hibernation. Um, and it's quite important that they do have options just in case, I don't know, one site might become flooded, for example, and they need to move elsewhere. So um, there's no reason to panic, especially on mild days as well. Um, they may well wake up, um, potter about, find something to drink, um, find something to eat, and then return to their nest and start hibernating again. Um, but yes, in mild years, it's not unusual to see hedgehogs active in December. And sometimes they do get caught out. So if they're awake when there's a sudden cold snap, um, they'll head back um, to hibernate um, until um, spring does properly arrive. So um, yes, potentially hibernating from November, but might be much later into the year. Um, and then again, uh, as to when they wake up really depends on when spring decides to spring. Um, but as soon as it becomes warmer, that's gonna trigger them to wake up. Um, and their first priority when they do, as you can imagine, is to find food. So again, this is where feeding hedgehogs is particularly useful. Um, and they really do appreciate everything that people put out for them. Um, you can imagine going without food for potentially three or four months, you would be incredibly hungry when you wake up. So food is the first priority. Um, and then, of course, comes making more hedgehogs. And clearly, this female is not at all interested in this male's advances. She's still tucking into the food there, and he'll probably get um, a nice telling off um, imminently. But essentially, um, their minds will, once they finished feeding up, turn to um, mating. And breeding can occur really any time between um, April and September. But the main peak or rut um, is really in May and June. So this is where you're most likely to um, either see or hear, because it is quite a noisy affair, hedgehog courtship. Um, and what this generally involves is a lot of posturing by the male. So he tends to, once he finds a potential mate, um, he'll start sort of circling around her. And as he does that, he make an awful lot of noise huffing and puffing um, and grunting. And as a result, this tends to attract other males um, who realize there's a female in the area. And as soon as a rival male turns up, that triggers a lot of um, headbutting and chasing and general aggression um, and lots of commotion, essentially, as he tries to fight off his rivals and, and essentially woo the female. Um, and assuming he is eventually successful, gestation takes about 35 days um, until we're met with uh, tiny baby hedgehogs. Um, this is what a baby hedgehog looks like, or, or a hoglet, they're called hoglets. And it doesn't look much like a hedgehog at this stage. Um, but the one thing you might notice is that there are, thankfully, no spines on this newborn hedgehog. So the spines do stay under the skin until the hedgehogs are born and they first emerge um, a few hours after birth. Um, and a typical litter um, usually has sort of four or five hoglets, but it might have as many as 12 in a particularly large litter. And um, yes, once the male's um, impregnated her, he's not interested, he wanders off. Most hedgehogs do have multiple mates, so he'll go off and find another female, um, and, and the females are left to rear the babies on their own. 
And this is what they look like when they're a few days old. Um, you can see they've got their first set of spines through and are looking much more like little wrinkly hedgehogs at this stage. And so those spines do provide them with some much needed protection from predators, even from an early age, and especially when they first learn to actually curl up, um, because they are incredibly vulnerable when they're first in the nest, completely dependent on their mum. Um, they can't really move around um, at first when they are very little, um, especially when they don't have their full set of spines. Um, lots of predators would be interested in eating them. So they do depend on their mum to look after them, to feed them on milk. Um, until they get to a few weeks old. So these ones are about six weeks and they're out of the nest. Um, they do leave the nest fairly early on, actually, um, when they're sort of three or four weeks old, potentially. Um, they'll be out and about and start exploring. Um, and these family outings, you'll usually start to see these perhaps in July at the earliest. Um, and they follow mum around for sort of a week or 10 days, maybe two weeks, and she sort of shows them the ropes. They figure out what's what and what you can eat and what you can't. Um, but then after those sort of couple of weeks, um, they're on their own. They wander off. They're independent. Um, and that's that. Um, so mum's done her job and her um, focus returns back to food. That said, sometimes um, they do go on to have a second litter. Um, often uh, this is quite late in the year and it can be problematic, especially if we don't get um, an Indian summer because the later the hoglets are born, the less time there is for them to grow uh, and feed and prepare for hibernation. So they do need to be um, a decent size to survive the winter. And this is the time of year when it's worth keeping an eye out for some really tiny baby hedgehogs um, in the garden. Um, these so-called sort of autumn juveniles or autumn orphans um they do um it's quite difficult to judge quite how big they are so um the size of a tennis ball helps kind of picture just how small they might be um and they do really need to be at least 800 grams if they're going to have a chance at surviving so a lot of these tiny ones end up having to be taken into rescue and overwintered in safety to make sure they can survive uh, and, and get released again next spring um, sadly, though, despite all these efforts to make more hedgehogs, they are in decline. Um, it's really difficult to know quite how many hedgehogs there are, um, but the estimate is that there were once 36 million, uh, which has declined uh, to 1.5 million. So that, the 36 million uh, figure was um, estimated in the 1950s and was probably a bit of an overestimate. And the 1.5 million was um, made in the 90s, which is probably more accurate but actually, even since then, um, they've declined even further. Um, so we think, you know, maybe there are one and a half million before there might only be about um, 500,000 left now. Um, and that's quite scary. That's, um, as, you know, it's often said that they're declining as fast as tigers are um, globally. And the figures are generally that we've lost over half of our hedgehogs from the countryside uh, since the year 2000. Um, and we've lost a third of them uh, from our towns and cities. Um, so they're declining at a significant rate, um, which is really worrying, especially since they are such generalist species. It really does signify something quite majorly wrong. Um, and recently they have been officially classified as vulnerable to extinction in the UK's first red list for British mammals. Um, and this gave the stats of uh, a decline of at least 46% over the 13 years. Um, so, you know, if things continued um, in the next 15 years or so, um, with no change there, we might actually see her chogs disappear completely. <clears throat> so the best available information that we do have um, comes from this report, which collates um, an awful lot of information. So this dates to 2018, but is the most recent version. As I say, it's really tricky to know quite how many hedgehogs there are. There's no sort of national census. Um, there's no way of sort of really accurately estimating how many hedgehogs a particular habitat might support. Um, and of course, they're nocturnal, which makes things a little bit more difficult. Um, but the best information that we do have is summarised in here and comes from some existing long term surveys. And interesting, the trends are different in rural versus urban areas. So the graphs here, the first thing you'll notice is both of them are going the wrong way. They're both showing a decline. Um, the top graph in blue is from Mammals on Roads. That's a survey of road-killed animals. So that's showing the proportion um, of hedgehogs. So it may seem like it's a good thing if we're seeing fewer hedgehogs um, killed on the roads, 
but actually that's an indication that their population is declining. Um, and contrary to what you might think, it's actually more positive to see plenty of dead hedgehogs squashed on the road because that means there's plenty of hedgehogs in the area to be squashed. So that's showing um, quite a significant decline. And the graph below in red, that's coming from the BTO's breeding bird survey data. So that includes information about hedgehogs and that's pr the proportion of sites that are reporting hedgehogs as part of their survey data. So again, you can see um, quite a significant decline and a downwards curve showing that hedgehogs um, do seem to be in quite a bit of trouble. In urban areas, the same data is showing a little bit of a different picture. So again, this is the um, living with mammals survey data. Um, so this is showing um, a decline, but a slight decline, and what seems to be a bit of a levelling off. Um, and if you look at the um, red triangles, um, the number of hedgehogs seen together at one time, so when people are seeing multiple hedgehogs, does seem to be going up. So that seems a lot more positive. Um, and again, the, the Garden Birdwatch data, which um, again collects information about hedgehogs that have been spotted. In fact, we've got the graph going the right way here. It's going up. Um, so that is certainly very positive. Um, so it's interesting to think, well, we've seen real declines in, in rural areas and perhaps a stabilisation or an improvement in urban areas. So why is that? What, what's going on? So in general, as with most species declines, um, it, a major problem really is habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. So if we think about the kind of traditional countryside landscape that hedgehogs would thrive in, that's changed quite significantly um, over the last few decades. Agriculture, um, it's on a much bigger scale. Fields are larger, um, intensified and kind of land management, lots of application of chemicals. So far less habitat and far less hedgehog food. It's generally less hospitable, as well as having roads um, and other features that really fragment the, the landscape and make it harder for hedgehogs to get around. We've lost um, thousands of kilometres of rural hedgerows as well. So that's had a knock on impact. And of course, they do have natural predators to contend with as well. And similar pressures really in the urban environment where roads do tend to be bigger and busier. Um, so perhaps even more of a barrier causing even more fragmentation, um, which is exacerbated by gardens that are really well fenced. Um, fences do provide really kind of impenetrable barriers to hedgehogs and other wildlife. Um, and gardens are often paved over or covered in plastic grass. So even if they can get in, there's really nothing for them. And again, loss of hedgerows, um, garden hedges um, are not as common as they once were. Lots of chemicals and a kind of trend for tidy outdoor spaces. And of course, lots of um, new developments um, encroaching on habitats, fragmenting habitats um, and creating even more barriers through fencing. So there's a lot to contend with um, for our hedgehogs. Um, but there's a fairly simple fix. So this is some guidance put together for farmers and landowners, and it really all centres on the importance of, of hedgerows. Um, and as we said, sort of, you know, they're an important habitat in themselves, but also their function as corridors. So we need to create more hedgerows. Um, we need to look after the ones that still exist to make sure there's no gaps and that they're thriving and lovely and thick and, um, and, and full of wildlife rather than sort of straggly, flailed um, sort of shadows of their former selves. But also looking at sort of how field margins are managed, uh, maybe looking to reinstate some hedgerows so that field sizes are smaller again, and generally resisting the urge to be too tidy. And exactly the same principles um, apply when we're thinking about gardens. So lots of us are lucky enough uh, to have a garden or some kind of outdoor space, maybe an allotment um, or school grounds or somewhere that we might have some kind of influence over or ability to persuade people to do something differently. And if we think along those same kind of principles, um, there's something we can all do to make these landscapes um, better for hedgehogs. And there is evidence that they are really becoming much more of a stronghold um, for them. Um, most of the reports of hedgehogs we do get, a lot of the hot, hot spots really are in the urban, urban areas. So that does show how important gardens are. Um, and this is a rather lovely little film that the British Hedgehog Preservation Society have put together. Um, and they've won awards for this, which is fantastic, but just highlights really um, the importance of gardens um, and what people can do with their gardens to help hedgehogs.
They're one of our best loved mammals, but hedgehogs are in steep decline. The secret to their survival, however, may lie in your own back garden. Private gardens can be wildlife havens, and if all joined up, would effectively form Britain's largest nature reserve. With our help, urban hedgehogs can thrive. Firstly, they need access. Hedgehogs must roam around a mile each night, so one garden isn't enough. And fences pose a problem. Making a 13 centimetre hole under your fence allows them to move freely. Encourage your neighbours to do the same and you will be creating a hedgehog highway. Let a corner of your garden go wild. Thick vegetation and fallen leaves offer a cosy retreat. And log piles provide both shelter and bugs for breakfast. Avoid using pesticides and slug pellets as these can be harmful. Leave out a shallow dish of water overnight, especially during dry spells. Never offer milk as it can cause sickness. Unfortunately, bonfires offer tempting homes for hogs, so always check underneath before lighting. Making these small gestures will go a long way towards ensuring that hedgehogs continue to roam our gardens. So we can uh, dig down into some of the points raised in that video. And it really is um, all about kind of creating the habitats for hedgehogs and habitats for hedgehog food. Um, and a lot of the things um, that are most helpful to do actually require doing less rather than doing more, which is always a bonus. So when we're thinking about um, our gardens in general, um, no matter the size, there'll be something that we can do um, to encourage natural hedgehog food, but most importantly, um, to provide access for hedgehogs in the first place. You could create an absolute wildlife haven in your back garden, but if hedgehogs and other creatures can't actually access it, um, it will all go to waste. So um, it's really easy to do this, um, and a 13 centimetre hole is all it needs, which is about the size of a CD case. So hopefully most people can accommodate that. Um, and you can see from these photos, people have actually managed to make holes um, using a special drill through brick walls even as well. And if you can't make a hole, sometimes it's possible to sort of dig underneath and make a little channel under the fence. Um, but access is absolutely vital for hedgehogs. Um, you might consider planting a hedge. So if you haven't already got one, um, you could certainly create your own hedgehog hedge. Um, if you've got an existing fence, you could plant it alongside the fence. Um, if you've got less room, you could create um, a little wild corner, perhaps a little copse of hedging plants. But creating um, a lovely dense native hedgerow, a good mix of species, some thorny ones, some evergreen ones, um, will create some really good food and shelter for hedgehogs, but also quite a wide range of wildlife um, as well. So it's always fantastic to plant a hedge. Um, if you can't plant a hedge, maybe plant a tree. Um, every little really does help. And nesting sites as well. So again, this is about sort of avoiding being too tidy. So if you do have a lot of leaves in your garden, it might be possible to rake them up uh, and leave them in a corner uh, where the hedgehogs can find them. Um, but nesting sites, as we spoke about with sort of hibernation sites, um, they will make use of a variety of features. Even uh, a sort of old paving slab lent up against a fence or shed um, can provide them with a structure that's useful um, for shelter. Um, feeding hedgehogs has to be one of the most popular pastimes. People love to put out food for hedgehogs. Um, you can do that absolutely by just putting a bowl out. It's often a good, um, a good uh, idea to set up a feeding station so you can try and control access to the food a little bit more and make sure the hedgehogs are the ones that are actually um, managing to eat it. Um, and it's really important just to not um, provide milk uh, for hedgehogs. They are lactose intolerant, so it can make them really poorly and bread isn't particularly good for them um, either. So what should you feed hedgehogs? The simplest thing is a meaty cattle dog food, especially if you might have a cattle dog and have a bit of food 
um, already in the house. It can be wet foods, it can be dry foods, although if it is dry, it's even more important to put out a shallow dish of water um, for them to access as well. And there are a whole range of different hedgehog foods that come uh, in all sorts of different um, configurations, whether it's sort of like a dry kibble, um, or like a bird seed mix, and you can get tins of, of wet hedgehog food as well. The one thing you just have to be a little bit careful about is mealworms. Um, these can cause a problem. Hedgehogs absolutely love them, but it's a bit like junk food. It's a bit like us sort of eating the crisps and the cake and leaving our greens. Ultimately, if they do eat a lot of mealworms, it causes um, a problem with their calcium balance uh, and ultimately can result in bone disease, which is pretty bad news for them. Um, so it's best to be pretty cautious when it comes to mealworms. Um, you can put out a few, um, but it really shouldn't be the main source of food um, for your local hedgehogs. And again, creating a feeding station, it can be dead simple. So a lot of um, people will use an old uh, plastic storage box. You can either leave the lid on or turn it upside down. And again, the hole is about the size of a CD case and it's weighted down with bricks so that any determined cats or foxes can't shove it around and gain access. And the idea is that really only things that are hedgehog size or smaller can get in there. So it's just to make sure that the neighborhood cats and foxes or badgers um, aren't scoffing the food that you really want the hedgehogs to have. Um, you can see a bricks being positioned just outside the entrance to this one. And the idea being that it's creating a bit more of a baffle. So um, they can't stick their heads straight through. The hedgehog has to go in and turn a corner. And depending on how determined the local um, foxes and cats and so on might be, you can get a bit more um, creative with your feeding station to, to really um, stop them from, from gaining access. But that can be um, a really good idea. But as well as providing supplementary food, it's really important um, and um, perhaps even more important to encourage their natural food. So these are the creepy crawlies, the mini beasts, um, the slugs, the snails, the beetles, the caterpillars. So something like a log pile is fantastic for that. There are loads of beetles and other um, invertebrates that depend on, on dead wood or will use that for shelter. Um, and that's really going to encourage plenty of natural hedgehog food. But the added bonus that the hedgehog can actually um, get in amongst the logs as well and use that potentially for shelter um, as well as food. And the same goes for compost heaps. They're fantastic. Um, hedgehog food producers are a great way to recycle your own waste and um, feed lots of, of, of worms and mini beasts and help encourage hedgehogs into the garden. And a uh, similar principle, really, when it comes to grass, a lot of gardens will have um, grass of some description um, and you can sort of um, basically cut the grass a bit less and that's going to encourage a lot more insect and invertebrate life. And you can take this as far as you want to. Um, you can mow just a bit less often and you'll get lots of things like daisies and buttercups um, and you can still walk around on there. Um, areas of short grass um, are valuable for feeding on, but longer grass provides sort of more opportunities for a lot of insects to kind of um, complete their um, reproductive cycles, laying eggs in there, providing shelter. So you can really let some areas grow um, very long um, and create mown paths so you can still access your garden and just so that it looks a bit more deliberate if the neighbours are wondering uh, if you've lost your lawnmower. Um, and you can create maybe just an area of wildflowers um, if you don't have any grass or even if you do as an alternative. Um, always a really popular activity. People love um, to create a wildflower area and they will thrive um, in a sunny area if you've got a spare flower bed um, or if you um, kind of dig up a section of your grass um, or in smaller spaces they will thrive in tubs and planters and pots as well to create um, a wonderful display of flowers and that's particularly good for, for butterflies and pollinators um, and um, of course that means more caterpillars and more food um, for the hedgehogs ultimately but the most you could the more you can do really to kind of increase the wildlife value of, of any element of the garden is going to be um, hugely beneficial and one of the best things you can ever do is add some water to the garden um, and a wildlife pond it doesn't have to be big it doesn't have to be particularly deep um, and it's sort of instantly attracts quite a wide range of wildlife frogs will find it um, insects that can fly in will find it and they get colonized amazingly quickly um, so that's again another source of invertebrate food but also a really good place for hedgehogs and other mammals to, to drink from. And if you have a small space, you can definitely get creative. Um, container ponds work just as well. Um, and frogs will manage to get in here um, to spawn even, and they'll, they'll find the water wherever it is. So again, a fantastic um, resource to have in the garden to enjoy watching wildlife as it appears. And you can really make the most of, of all surfaces, especially if you've got a small space 
um, gardening vertically, um, essentially turning your fence into a green wall or growing climbers up against it if you can't create a hedge, um, covering all the surfaces that you possibly can and to create all these kind of micro habitats and plenty of different plants and, and flowers is all um, going to help increase the diversity um, of the wildlife and the insects in the garden. And bulk hotels, another really popular option, people love creating these. Um, and again, they're sort of like a deluxe log pile, really, trying to create as many micro habitats and little niches uh, for creepy crawlies as possible. And again, um, kind of growing upwards with that so you can create something that fits the space that you've got. Um, and ultimately, I mean, wouldn't this be wonderful if we all had something like this um, in our gardens? Plenty of trees, lots of long grass and flowering plants and those sort of tall post structures are all um, kind of insect homes of some description. And that's absolutely ideal for hedgehogs um, and for other wildlife. So once you've gone to all the effort of creating all of this, of course, you want to try and avoid using any chemicals and pesticides in the garden, which are going to end up killing off the very hedgehog food you're trying to encourage. Um, so again, this, these are all on the, on the menu. And hopefully, the more you can do to create habitats for these and the more of these you have, um, the better the hedgehogs will do. There's also a few hazards that the hedgehogs might encounter. So ponds are brilliant, um, but it is really important to make sure that they are safe. Hedgehogs can swim, um, but they do encounter a problem if when they fall in, they can't get out again. So it's really important to create um, a shallow sort of sloping beach area if you're putting in a new pond or create um, a way for hedgehogs and other creatures to get in and out of the pond if you can't do that or if you've got an existing pond. Um, because otherwise, you know, they can swim, but eventually if they can't get out, they will get exhausted and um, they can potentially drown, which would be um, quite a tragedy. And other hazards, as mentioned in the video, bonfires, and we're kind of coming up to bonfire season again now. Of course, an unlit bonfire looks exactly like a log pile. It's really um, intriguing and like a great place for a hedgehog to set up home for the winter. And of course, it'd be absolutely disastrous if once that's set to light. So um, if you're going to have a bonfire, then the advice is um, to kind of make it and burn it all on the same day. Or if you've got stacked materials, to move them um, and then set fire, or at the very least, really carefully lift and check anything that you're intending to burn to, to, to make sure there's no hedgehogs or other wildlife sitting inside. Um, and also strimmers and other garden machinery is really dangerous for hedgehogs. Um, you can just imagine um, the awful wounds um, that can be inflicted by a strimmer going through um, a section of long grass where a hedgehog's just trying to shelter inside. So the wildlife rescues are always um, dealing with these um, awful cases of strimmer injuries and often um, they are fatal as well. So it's just worth taking a bit of extra care when you're working in the garden to make sure that you're not going to inadvertently harm the hedgehogs you're trying to help. Um, and it's really important. I mean, hedgehogs do get themselves into all kinds of trouble. And sadly, if you do see a hedgehog, often it means it's it's um, not in the best way. So a lot of people will see them during the daytime, um, which is really an indication that something's wrong for a nocturnal creature to be out and about during the day. It means there's a problem. So um, some of the things to look out for, um, people often spot hedgehogs that seem to be sunbathing um, and, and that really is um, not something that they do. So hedgehogs don't sunbathe. If you see one doing that, it's in a bad way, it needs help. Um, a sign of uh, illness or, or injury is lots of flies, if they're particularly wobbly. Sometimes they do have obvious injuries or they get themselves trapped um, somewhere. And again, if you see little tiny baby hedgehogs out on their own, um, that's time to call a wildlife rescue. We do get lots of calls about people worried about their hedgehogs. People do understandably feel very protective of the ones that live in their gardens or pass through their gardens and want to do something to help. So we do have a list of local wildlife rescues that we can put people in touch with to help hedgehogs. But essentially, if you spot one out during the day, um, unless, I mean, the only exception really is a female out during the day, um, during breeding season, sometimes they're out and about collecting nesting material, trying to find food. Um, that really is the only exception to the rule. Um, so, um, yeah, a really important way to help hedgehogs um, is to call for expert help as soon as you see one um, in need of, of, of a vet um, or an expert carer. Um, and of course, as well as doing all of that, um, a really valuable way to help is actually to report your sightings so that we know where hedgehogs are um, and we can identify any hotspots and see where they're thriving or see where there's gaps. Um, so it's really easy uh, to report a wildlife sighting, the key information being uh, what, where, when and who, um, so that we can get in touch if we need to follow up. Um, so 
you know, in the case of a hedgehog, you can identify where you found it. A postcode is a really good way for a grid reference to be generated, or you can get a grid reference, um, or there's what three words, which is even better because that's really specific. Um, so it's what you saw, where you saw it, and when you saw it. And the best way to report your sightings is via a website called iRecord. And there's also a really handy app if you have that on your phone, which will generate the grid reference for you. Um, so absolutely would encourage you to record hedgehogs and any other wildlife sightings, the more the merrier, via iRecord. It gives really useful information that goes straight to the local record centre um, and gets used for a whole variety of, 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 of uses from conservation to planning and to all sorts. So that's the best way um, to really improve the ecological um, evidence base. And there is also the big hedgehog map. So the Hedgehog Street website is a fantastic resource and it does host this map where you can log uh, your hedgehog sightings, alive or dead, and you can also map where you've created your hedgehog highways, made holes in your fences. That's so really showing where people are making the effort to help the hedgehogs um, and where hedgehogs are being spotted in your area. So you can go there and have a look and see what's being reported in your neighbourhood. Um, and if you know there's hedgehogs and there's none on the map, then perhaps you can add them in and make sure they're being noticed. So um, really, to sum up, uh, there's an awful lot of gardens in the UK. Um, and when you add them up, they're clearly a really important resource for wildlife. And we know from the data, the data seems to be showing us how important, particularly urban areas and gardens are for hedgehogs. Um, so absolutely, you know, doing these things, sometimes it feels like, mm, is it really going to make a difference? But it does make a difference um, and it really does add up. Um, so I would certainly encourage you to, to have a think about um, what you might be able to do in your garden, um, because it does absolutely make a difference um, for hedgehogs. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. That was really interesting. Brilliant to see all those pictures of hedgehogs as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we've got time for a few questions. Um, luckily, you answered quite a lot of them as we were going on, particularly uh, one from Clive that was my favourite question, which was, do hedgehogs swim? Which uh, was um, good to see that great photo of them actually swimming as well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, Vicky has asked, um, she is moving to a house which unfortunately has a garden that's all astroturf so is there any advice you can give her to how she can attract hedgehogs to that garden or is it a lost cause yeah i mean ideally of course it would be let's take up that astroturf and, and get some real grass down and some um some other habitats so it might depend on whether that's actually possible um, but even if it's not you can certainly do some some stuff for hedgehogs that will that will help um, so if there's scope maybe even just to remove some of it and create some flower beds or, or plant some shrubs and things um, that's going to help um, but at the very least if there's, assuming there's access you could certainly put down um, food and water um, maybe some sort of you know a hedgehog house so that it's there's somewhere to take refuge because it may well be um, passing through your neighborhood so anything that's within your garden if it's passing through even if your garden can't offer a huge amount um, there's still things that you can do to make sure it, it's not producing too much of a barrier for them um, but if you can't take it up or create flower beds then there's still possibilities with tubs and sort of more portable gardening and maybe some vertical gardening if you've got fences and walls that you can sort of attach planters to or, or get climbers going. Um, so all of that is, is definitely going to be helpful. Excellent. Um, we've had um, a question from Anne who mentioned that um, some hedgehog houses, uh, I think some of the supermarkets were selling last year, were uh, potentially causing some injuries to hedgehogs. So is there anything particular you should look for if you're buying a hog house? Yeah, I mean, the better ones tend to be the sort of more solid um, wooden designs. You see um, a lot of the more kind of woven structures um, tend to be probably useful for sort of temporary shelters, but maybe not the best um, for sort of long term or, or overwintering inside. Um, so it's a bit like when you're looking for a good bird box, you want to make sure that it's quite um, solidly built with thick wood 
because that does help to insulate it. So um, often they will have like a little entrance um, tunnel, which helps protect the hedgehogs from sort of anything larger getting in. Um, but ones that sort of, the ones that look less decorative and more functional tend to be better options from the hedgehog's perspective. Um, so yeah, even though that lovely little stone house with the green roof looks really attractive to people, it might not have been uh, the best option for, he for hedgehogs. Excellent, thank you. Um, is there an obvious way to tell male and female hedgehogs apart? No, there really isn't. I mean, sometimes you can tell from the behaviour. Um, so if you noticed in the garden um, there was one hedgehog being circled by another hedgehog, you could probably tell that one's um, the female and one's the male doing the circling. Um, but in terms of just looking at a hedgehog, you can't really tell whether it's a male or a female. Um, the males may well be larger, but, you know, it depends on their relative ages and all sorts. Um, so um, no, not really, unless you happen to observe some behaviour that maybe gives you a few clues. Excellent. Uh, that was a question from Mike and Sue. Um, all right, I've got a couple more about houses. Um, Jane asks, should you put leaves and uh, straw in a hedgehog house or leave it bare for them to do their own? And uh, I can't find who asked the question. Apologies. Oh, oh, Jane asked, uh, do they come back to the same nesting site uh, year on year as well? OK, yeah, good question. I mean, you certainly can put nesting materials in um, as a bit of a starter. It might sort of help encourage hedgehogs um, to mosey in. But I think probably the most the more important factor is, is getting the positioning of your hedgehog home right. So they tend to do best often alongside a boundary. So if you have got a fence in your garden, if you put the house alongside the fence, but somewhere nice and sheltered. So um, often underneath sort of shrubs um, or other dense vegetation where they're not going to get too wet um, and they're kind of tucked away, um, they tend to be occupied um, the most. But you could certainly pop, it won't do any harm to put some straw or leaves um, inside the box. Um, and especially if you sort of leave a lot of leaves um, sort of in the area or in the garden so the hedgehogs um, will find that but they do generally find um, and use their own bedding um, and bring what they want um, and then in terms of reusing the same nest sites I mean potentially if it proves to be a really good safe haven for them um, and assuming that they survive year to year um, and they're still using the same home range there's no reason why they wouldn't return I don't know if we know for sure um, whether they're sort of particularly site faithful um, but they certainly could be, especially if you've got sort of a top-notch accommodation for them. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've probably got time for one, maybe a couple more questions, actually. We've, we've had a few asked about um, badgers and their relationships with hedgehogs. Um, Martin has said that with badger numbers have seemed to increase in the countryside at the same time as the hogs, uh, hedgehogs are declining, uh, has there been any research to see if there's any correlation between the two? Yeah, I mean, there is some research, which is quite interesting. Um, I mean, essentially, badgers um, and hedgehogs have a really similar um, lifestyle. They have the same habitat requirements. They eat a really similar diet. Um, so they tend to sort of coexist, but sort of compete for resources to a certain extent. So what you might find is that when they are squeezed because of um, the habitat loss, the fragmentation, the lack of food, obviously badgers being um, a predator of hedgehogs, they can certainly turn to hedgehogs and eat them if other food um, is less available. Um, but I mean, there does seem to be some evidence. I mean, we are still seeing um, the same rate of decline in areas where there are badgers um, versus areas where there are no badgers. Um, so it's probably one of those things where there's quite a complex interaction going on and it's not as simple as, as we might um, think it is. Um, but certainly, I mean, they've, they've obviously coexisted uh, for thousands of years um, and, and, you know, the presence of badgers doesn't necessarily mean there will be no hedgehogs, but certainly in some areas where pressures are already high, having lots of badgers on top of everything else is clearly going to make life even tougher for hedgehogs. Um, but you, there's no evidence, I mean, that, that we know of really, that badgers are the ultimate cause. There's a lot of factors and a lot of interacting factors, and it's it's all quite complicated. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're an element uh, to it, but uh, as far as we know, not a primary cause of hedgehog decline. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, Millie asks, what's the best thing you can do for hedgehogs if you don't have a garden? The best thing you can probably do, um, I mean, if you don't have a garden of your own, um, maybe if, you're, if you go to school or if you have a workplace or some other outdoor space, um, try to influence that. Um, if you can't do that, then try and keep an eye out for hedgehogs um, because reporting them and logging your sightings, that's really valuable information. That really helps. Um, but also talking to other people. So if you've got friends um, that do have gardens, try and encourage them to think about hedgehogs um, because it really is kind of, you know, a neighbourhood approach. So even if you don't have a garden yourself, um, if you can chat to other people that live nearby that do, the more people that kind of get on board and make some of these small changes and create the highways and access points, it's really going to make a difference for, for the hedgehogs at the landscape scale. But um, yeah, share your hedgehog enthusiasm is probably the best thing you can do. Excellent. Well, we're all definitely enthusiastic about hedgehogs here, so that's um, brilliant. Um, thank you to everybody who's um, sent in questions and comments and telling us about um, hedgehogs that you've seen in your local, local area as well. It's been really nice to see all those. Thank you ever so much to Charlotte for that fascinating talk um, and to uh, Janet and the Eastbourne group for arranging tonight's webinar. Um, when I close this webinar you will be directed to a web page which will have loads more links to find out lots more things about hedgehogs um how to build your own hedgehog house um how to report them and links to wild call as well if you have any other um questions there's also an opportunity to make a donation if you would like there and if you aren't a member of the sussex wildlife trust then you can join the sussex wildlife trust and help look after hedgehogs that way as well. So thank you again to everybody uh, for coming along tonight um, and to Charlotte for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.